What's going on, people? We are Tottenham TV back here for yet another Tottenham update for you guys. Uh, just before we get into it, please do join us on podcasting platforms such as Spotify under the name of obviously We Are Tottenham TV and go and head over to our website where you'll find the latest articles and merchandise available from We Are Tottenham TV store at wearetottenhamtv.com, as you can see at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. But let's get straight into it and let's talk about this Scott Munn interview that has come out today. Um, um, speaking about various different topics. We'll take it quote by quote from the quotes that I have picked out. And he, first of all, he's talking about his first 12 months at Spurs. And he says, I think the club today off the pitch compared to where the club was 12 months ago is vastly different. But I would like to say this is a huge club. It's been around for over 100 years with an incredible history in North London. To be given the privilege to help drive that and work with the chairman and the rest of the board and make change has been fantastic. And we're seeing that. The women's team last weekend winning, beating Man City to go through to the FA Cup semi-final, which will be fantastic. But also the men's team are doing incredibly well this year. I think we're playing a wonderful brand of football it's attractive it's back to where the dna of spurs was about and we just need to keep uh, continuing to improve and challenge ourselves and we'll have another window in the summer and i think we want to position ourselves as best as we can for the start of the next year's premier league season so i mean not much in it but i guess positive steps have been made yeah, and I think we've seen big changes since Scott Munn's come in, um, not just on the player front, but obviously in the um, behind the scenes front, uh, in the backroom staff, in the uh, kind of director's um, position. Obviously, Levy uh, now has Scott Munn and, and uh, Johan Lang, uh, Johan Lange um, directing more on the footballing side of the operations, albeit Scott Munn is doing... Um, more commercial side but I think having these people involved is, is a massive benefit to us and also takes the pressure off Daniel Levy to be as controlling as he was previously and I think that's led to better decision making and I think that's bearing out on the pitch Yeah I completely agree and he goes on to talk about looking ahead for next season and he's talking and he says every window we have an opportunity to improve the team and change the team we've had two now and I think we've brought in some players who have continued to improve the team another window gives us another opportunity to do that and also another pre-season together I think Ange came in just before last pre-season Season and the team had a disjointed start but they'll get a good run at it this year and I think there's a real opportunity for us to be ready for the start of next season clearly our focus now is this season and finishing as high as possible we've got a tough run in but I think that we can uh, it can also help shape it and we're in charge of our own destiny uh, which is the most important thing for us and um, yeah it's spot on obviously everyone is already looking forward to next transfer window in terms of the summer but this season with the business that they have done since they've come in has been um, you know a massive change of the football club yeah and it seems to be more strategic and it seems as well um, more focused on the future and definitely focused on improving our weakest points and uh, that is the most positive thing for example we in the January window, you know, we needed a centre back, we needed a winger, and we and we got those things. You can argue whether it was a required quality, but we did we did definitely get where what we wanted in terms of position wise. Same in the kind summer. Kind of did need two centre backs, so we brought one in the in January. Yeah, but we, we know three centre backs is enough for, to, to last it to the end of the season, uh, considering the amount of game times we got. Um, and then you look at the summer; it was very targeted in getting the likes of Madison and Van der Ven players that we needed um, desperately in the squad. So I do think uh, the transfer windows have been very positive since Scott Munn and yeah uh, has come in, and I really hope the summer follows suit. And obviously, um, Ange has been saying in next season he's not looking at top four; he's looking at the top. And I hope, I'm hoping that as well um, the club are following that ambition. What I would say to that is that I felt like, and I think we all felt like this, or the majority of us felt like this, that after the summer business, yes, it was very good. Yes, uh, the calibre of player that was coming in was of the required ability. But we did leave ourselves too short in the summer. Yes, we corrected that in January. But if that was done in the summer, then maybe we would not be sitting here in the situation that we're in right now. Completely agree. So that was the only maybe downside if I'm being picky. Well, not even being picky. I think it was a, a, the downside of the window. I, yeah, I don't think anyone disagrees with that. 
Um, and then he's talking about the, on balancing focus on the end of the season and also preparing for next. And he says, I think one of the great things is that we've uh, got an amazing team. We've got an amazing technical team that are absolutely focused on this season and are wavering and Ange um, and his team are doing wonderful things, but they're also focused on finishing this season. Then we have people who are already looking at next season. So it's just keeping people focused on the roles that they've got and making sure that we can be uh, the best in the best possible, the best that we could possibly be. Um, again, there's not that much in it. I mean, pretty obvious uh, when, when you're looking at it. Yeah, but I think Anne said recently, you know, the plans for next season are, are already underway and they're already planning. And that's really, really great to hear that uh, they're getting ahead of the game and they're not just waiting till the end of the season to start putting plans in motion for next season. Um, that's really important, I think, when we're talking about um, looking towards the future. It doesn't just mean um, strategy-wise. like It doesn't just mean like we sound like a star and dog and then we just stop and say, okay, the future's settled. And we have like Donnelly, Divine, all these players. Look, the future looks bright. But it doesn't mean you just stop there. You've got to continually plan. It never stops. <laughs> Similar to Andy's philosophy. It really doesn't stop at any moment. You've got to keep thinking about the next thing and the next thing. So... I'm glad that Anne shed it, and now I'm glad Scott Munn is already was also confirming that you know the plans for next season are already underway, and let's hope that um, that we really start to execute those plans uh, when the season ends. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, we have. You know, we went into this summer window just gone, uh, well, last summer, and we made some early purchases. And then by the end of the window, it felt like we were still scrambling around without with a, with a bit without a plan really to get that second centre back in. And you know, Davinson Sanchez left after the window, so. I hope they're more meticulously planning as opposed to what they did in the summer because I think the summer was planned to a certain extent, but then by the end of it, it seemed a bit messy. Well, in a weird way, because it's Andrew's first year, it's always going to be a bit messy because he's he's not going to be 100% sure who he wants to keep or not because he hasn't seen them properly. Now he's had a year, he's going to be a lot more sure this guy needs to go, this guy needs to stay and what he actually wants. And I'm sure Ange himself would have told you, look, when you, when you first come into a job, Yes, you're going to have an idea of who you want to keep and all these kind of things. And in training, you know, you can see what you want, but it's not going to be fully, um, it's not going to be fully in your mind. You're not going to have 100% certainty about what you want until you see them properly on the pitch. So now he's seen them. I think this, this, this summer will hopefully be a lot more targeted and strategic than it was last summer. Hope so. Um, and he talks about, working with Ange Postacoglu and he says it's good uh, look we're Australian so we have the same jokes we um, we get to watch a bit of the A-League in the morning on Thursdays when we're in the office but he's embraced everything that Spurs is about he wants success and is and that is sustained success so our alignment is completely in lockstep and um, that's great to hear isn't it yeah fantastic uh, g glad that they're getting on on another level as well as opposed to just um how they're strategically planning from Tottenham's point of view. I think it's very good to have those kind of relationships as well in the workplace. So uh, very positive. And then finally, he is talking about working with Daniel Levy. And he says, Daniel is incredibly invested in the club personally and professionally. And I don't think one person has a great single focus on success for the club than him. And I feel absolutely privileged to work with him and, and the support he has given me and the entire football club is unconditional. I just hope we're able to repay the faith he has put in us. And uh, you don't expect him to say anything else to the guy that's paying his wages. <laughs> Well, look, I'm sure he's. I'm sure he means what he says. Look, I think if you're working at that kind of level, you probably do appreciate what Levy does, uh, for because people have seen what um, how he operates and what he how ambitious he is, how ambitious he is from a business standpoint. And if you're operating at that kind of level, you're going to be appreciative of that, and they're going to just see the brass, the the facts that. Um, look how we've improved on the pitch in terms of since when we took over to now and there's no doubting that things have improved from a club stature point of view things have improved from in terms of how um consistently finishing European places point of european places point of view so if you're coming into the club and you're new to the club and you're seeing all these things you're seeing him being a tough negotiator and wanting the best for the club on that on the business front you're obviously going to have a lot of positive thoughts about him as fans we have different opinions because um we're all about um, you know, trying to get glory for for this team. That's what Spurs has always been about and it's always been a cup-winning team uh, historically and we've lost that element to us since Levy's taken over. So 
there's obviously that uh, difference, but I, I believe he means what he says, Scott Munn. Yeah, I mean, we have heard people that have been working with inside the club, whether it be sporting director or whatever kind of facet they come into the club, that maybe whilst they're working in the club, they have nothing but high praise. But then once they leave, you just kind of hear a bit of truth coming out. But I do feel like since Scott Munn has come in, the club have gone in a much different direction. Exactly. So I, I, I don't doubt that he's got nothing but nice things to say. Let's talk about a potential transfer now. He goes by the name of Ben Johnson from West Ham. Caught offside, not the most reputable source, say that Tottenham are in pole position to sign West Ham's defender Ben Johnson following a recommendation from club legend Dudley King. It's known that Ange uh, Postacoglu is eager to provide competition for Pedro Porra and Destiny Adoghi. The West Ham player will leave the London Stadium as a free agent at the end of the current campaign due to the Bosman ruling. Um... Regarding Ben Johnson, I was actually a fan of his when he first broke into the West Ham team. But I mean, since then, I don't think he's pulled up any trees. He is cousin of Ledley King. So you've got to, <laughs> that's uh, got to be a caveat put in there. And when a player is on a Bosman ruling and looking to leave a club for free, that's always going to spark the ears of Daniel Levy. It doesn't sound like a recommendation. It sounds like nepotism. <laughs> but um, I don't think he knows what his best position is, Ben Johnson. He's played left back, right back. He's played right mid on one game. I remember, I remember against Arsenal, he played on the wing and um, obviously they got slaughtered that day. I think he broke in as a centre-back, but hasn't really maintained a position in, in that. In I thought that he broke play. in as a right-back. Um, I think by trade, if I'm if I'm right in saying, I think he is a centre back. But he's like one of those like like how Dyer came into the club as a centre back, then like was moved out to right back, so we had needed him there. I think that's kind of how I see Ben Johnson. I might be wrong on that, but that's. that's I thought his natural position was right back. I mean, I don't, I don't I see him as a right back. To be honest, from, from I think he's more tall. He's like he's very focused on the defensive side of his game. I don't think he's a very good. Um, play on the ball I've never seen him do much in terms of quality on the ball I don't think he's a very good passer um, he's very good in the air he's tall he's strong um, I definitely would see him more as, for me I see him more as a centre back than a, than a full back but uh, I do think he's probably had more game time at full back just because um, West Ham are more well stocked then I do think he's probably like the backup full back there so I've never been that impressed with him recently when um, when I've seen him play. He has, uh, yeah, when he first broke in, he looked like a good young defender, but it's not one I would consider for Tottenham. I think we need better quality technical players, and I don't think Johnson is, I mean, it fits into that. He's 24 now. It's not like he's 19, 20 anymore. You know what I mean? He first broke in um, in 2020, about four years ago, and... His, his game time seems to be decreasing and decreasing year on year. And if you can't get into the West Ham team, what chance have you got of getting in the Tottenham team? That's just essentially the real, reality. Well, just, but also the reality is he's English, he's 24, so he's not not old as well. And uh, he's a versatile defender. So we'll, we'll suppose just be looking at those facts and he's going to be on a free. So could they? do they see an opportunity there potentially? I don't think it's an opportunity worth taking personally. I mean, I'm looking at it and... We had that Carl Walker Peters rumours a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, I don't really want Carl Walker Peters at the back, back of the club. But if I'm comparing the two players, I'd much prefer Carl Walker Peters than Ben Johnson. I completely agree. I think Carl Walker Peters would fit what we're trying to do much more than Ben Johnson, for sure. But regardless, opinion. I think we need better quality than both of them. Mm. Next up, Timo Werner. We brought you a similar story a couple of days ago, but Florian Petterberg saying that Timo Werner feels very comfortable at Tottenham and would like to stay for the long term. The option to buy is around 17 million euros must be activated by the start of the Euros in June at the latest. A future at RB Leipzig is unlikely for either side. Contract is valid until 2026. If Tottenham does not permanently sign him, Werner is open to leaving Leipzig this summer. Um, and I don't think maybe we're as... We're still completely unsure on him. Yeah, and that, that was the story a couple of days ago. I don't think that miss against Fulham would have helped his cause, that's for sure. Look, we, we, we did this update a few days ago and we got quite a bit of heat in the comments I was seeing because we were kind of saying we we, we don't think um, signing him permanently would be the best thing for us in terms of just taking us to the next level. And I still stand by that. I don't think the, the miss against Fulham has changed my opinion into negatively, but not obviously not positively. Uh, that miss against Fulham was terrible. No, It was a pr proper classic Timo miss, which is... Uh, uh, one that you've seen many times in his compilation videos of, of his misses. Um, so that, that was obviously disappointing. Um, I do think he's done well. And I actually thought in a weird way against Fulham, he came on and had a good good um, impact. I thought he actually did well when he came on, but unfortunately that miss that he had overshadowed that. I just think with Timo Werner, I think he's 
doing a good job for us. I mean, I'm going to say the same thing I said a few days ago. He's doing a good job with us in the short term. I think he's made an impact. He's maybe covered us um, for the short term when we've had players out and beat players away for international duty. And I don't, I'm not complaining at all with how he's performed. I think he's performed at a good enough level to see us till the end of the season. But unfortunately, I just don't think he's the kind of player who's going to take us to the next level. If we ever really have serious ambitions about challenging the top three, um, I just don't think Timo is of the is the required quality of the player that we need. Look, and as I say, if Timo cut, if we do sign him permanently and we sign another winger for big big money, um, maybe for I I'm not gonna I don't think it's the worst thing in the world because obviously I think Timo for that kind of money is is a it's a good price and I do think it, it probably is it does represent value for money on that front. But I would rather just not sign him and then spend big on two wingers rather than go cheap on Werner and sign an expensive winger. So um, I'm not like dead set against it. I would just rather we didn't. Essentially. We need we need to stop thinking about value for money signings and, and go for value for football signings instead, basically, because we need to be looking, like you said, to challenging those top three. And players like Timo Werner, probably players like Manuel Solomons, definitely players like Ben Johnson, are not going to be getting any uh, getting us closer to those top three signings. And all these three, three, three players, we're not going to be signing them because they're players that can get us close to top three. We're going to be signing them because they're value for money players. And that's the kind of attitude Spurs need to get away from, in my opinion. And Timo Werner, when we brought you the last update, I think it was after the Aston Villa game, after he had that great cameo, scored the goal, and obviously on the back of a good performance against Crystal Palace when he scored, he's backed it up with that big miss. And I think people's maybe reactions are going to be more negative now than they were maybe on the back of those two performances but I like Timo I like his attitude but I just feel like we should be setting our sights higher than him but he's still got nine games to prove us wrong yep and I really hope he can prove us wrong but jury's out I guess Manuel Solomon up next he's had a message to the fans on Instagram regarding his injury and he says lately I've been away from social media and focusing solely on my rehab and getting back on the field the last period has been the most difficult and frustrating of my career in the past five months I've been working as hard as possible to get back to doing what I love the most but unfortunately I haven't fully recovered yet at the same time I'm full of motivation to continue doing everything in order to be back stronger than ever to help my club and country thank you for your support Support and see you guys soon and that was obviously on the back of the news that um you know they never gave us a time frame but from the news that they gave us it seems as though he's going to miss the majority if not all the season well they refuse to confirm that he's going to be back before the end of the season that's not good news at all and considering that we were supposed to have him back by about january february time and then he kept getting um he kept basically getting delayed delayed and at the moment it's uh, not looking good uh, for Manuel Solomon when it comes to um, him being available for the rest of the season uh, I think for the Palace game there was a lot of rumours that he was set to be available for that game and then he had a last minute um, setback again so I feel bad for him but I but again it just it does um, the question is as well going into next season what we how we consider Manuel because um it's, this is the second season in a row he's had a serious injury which has kept him out for over six months because uh, when he signed for Fulham he he immediately got injured and was out until about February time mm. and um, similar things happened at Spurs he got injured uh, in October and now he's looks like he's going to be out for the rest of the season so I know he's a good player and we got him on a free but I don't know whether look I don't know if we can sell him at, in the summer but I don't know whether we should consider him a squad option in terms of one of our main players that are going to be in rotation for the winger spots because um, I don't know if he can rely upon at the moment. And I don't know if he's good enough to like say, like even if he is going to be fit, is he even? We don't even know if he's good enough when he is fit. So it's a whole messy situation now. Yeah, but what what kind of are the options here? Because how you no one's going to buy him at, at this current rate with these injury, the level of injuries that he's had. Is it a case of just, I don't know, like what, what can you do from here? There's no Loan other option. Loan him out? Is someone going to take him on loan even with these injuries? Maybe. Maybe if it's not too big of a commitment, they might. Mm, loan him back to Shakhtar. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be fun. Maybe. Um, and talking of Shakhtar, 
The Shakhtar uh, CEO, Sergi Palkin, has also been talking about the Manuel Solomon situation. This situation is still going on between Shakhtar and Tottenham Hotspur. And uh, this is quite a long-winded one. He said, since October, we have been diligently engaged in negotiation with Spurs, but finally Tottenham have not acted in the manner that reflects the principles and fairness of equity. In this situation, we feel a sense of disrespect from Tottenham. Actually, we would like to appeal to Spurs chairman Daniel Levy to act in good faith and uphold the share values of the European football family to find a fair way to compensate us in this transfer what we are talking about. They offered something but it's not even as serious what they offered. It is something like peanuts to show they're ready to give something but this is not comparable to what they received. A club like Tottenham cannot behave like this. It is a top well-known worldwide club and to behave like this they are doing something very strange. We negotiated with them for many months. We respect them and didn't ask to be honest for some kind of huge amount. We didn't even ask for money. We said, okay, give us a sell on fee for the future. When you receive a player for free, this player is when this and this player is worth 20 million euros, the transfer market always undervalues players. It means something. It means we developed and invested in this player. You should respect our work. If we all say we are one football family, after that you receive a player for free and don't pay attention on our side. It is fair to me, fair for me, 20%, 30% would be fair value in the situation uh, would be a fair value. We are going to bring legal action against Spurs if needed. But in any case, why am I appealing to the chairman of Spurs is because I believe that he will give his hand and support us. We have a war in the country and they should pay attention to this. When when the war started in our country, the whole democratic world supported us. I'm appealing to this kind of morale to help us. But in any case, in our arguments with FIFA, yes, we lost in CAS and it is difficult to fight against the system. But in any case, we believe if clubs receive something for free, it is unjust enrichment. We will go to the court and do our best uh, to get some kind of compensation because we invest a lot of money in, into players and it's possible to have this kind of situation. We need to share our problems to help uh, from the clubs. If FIFA and the ECA say that we are one big football family, we should be a family and not like this. And then a Tottenham spokesman said, uh, we made a donation to Shakhtar's foundation following the friendly last summer and we continue to discuss the situation with them, but not via the press. So uh, the Shakhtar chairman, his stance is getting stronger and stronger on this. I mean, I'm not sure if he has much of a leg to stand on uh, legally because of the ruling that uh, UEFA and FIFA made, or I'm not, I'm not sure if it was UEFA or FIFA, but one of them made that ruling saying that because of the war, a player can join for free. Um, but in terms of morality, do Tottenham have a moral standpoint to give a fee to Shakhtar as opposed to maybe even a sell-on fee for Manor Solomon? Um, I would say that from a moral standpoint, considering we took him for free in in very dubious circumstances, I know it was the rules, but because of the war in Ukraine, it allowed um, Spurs to basically take uh, Solomon for free because his contract ran out, essentially, because um, we're allowed to take him for a year so he can get out of Ukraine and it takes him to the end of his contract. Um, I do think... It is in terms of morally and ethically, Spurs should probably give uh, Shakhtar some sort of kickback. But then again, how, what are they obli obligated to give? And um, are they obligated to just bow to whatever Shakhtar want? I would say no. They're not. They're not obligated to do that. But it doesn't sound like they're asking for a lot. Twenty, thirty percent sell-on clause. Considering we got him for nothing, and there's a quite a likelihood we might sell him uh, after this injury. Um, like I wouldn't like I do think that's probably a fair thing. Uh, they're not even asking for money, as as he said. They're not asking for a fee. Uh, they're just asking for some sort of compensation for a for a for a big asset which they, you know, bought for a, a relatively small amount and because of his uh, uh, development became a highly wanted asset um, from around Europe and in the Premier League. And you know, Fulham signed him and then t went to Tottenham. So clearly they did something right. And just because the country of Ukraine, you know, is in a war with Russia, why should they be punished with that? I understand that. So I feel for the chairman, um, but you're dealing with the hardest negotiator in the Premier League right now. And you're not going to get uh, um, something for, uh, if, he if he doesn't need to give it, if you know what I mean. So, um, 
I think he, he's just going to have to make his peace with it at the end of the day. As much as I, I would implore Levy to do what he can to to do what's right in this situation, I, you, Levy is going to do what he wants and he's not going to give uh, something up for for no reason. So I think that's the reality of the situation. Yeah, it seems to be like this Shakhtar boss CEO is, is fighting a losing battle, uh, to be honest, when you're looking at it like... If Daniel Levy has no legal obligation to give anything like that, to give any sort of money over to Shakhtar for this player, for Manuel Solomon, he's not going to do it. That's just the reality, isn't it? Yeah. So I think uh, he's probably just wasting his time and his breath, um, the CEO. Uh, but we'll see how this one pans out. Next up, we're going to talk about Brennan Johnson as the Nottingham Forest got docked four points in the Premier League yesterday. And there was a report coming out from the Premier League Commission and the official report stated that Atletico Madrid made a 50 million euro bid for Brennan Johnson at the end of 2023. But Nottingham Forest did ask for 65 million. Uh, Forest did eventually uh, sell Brennan for 47 and a half million pounds, which was payable in instalments for Brennan Johnson. So I was quite surprised when I saw this and saw that um, Atletico, I think it was actually two bids that they made. Mm. 50 million euros in 65. So that is um, significant money for a, for especially for a club like Atletico Madrid to go for uh, someone like Brendan Johnson. It's quite a big amount to uh, for them to reject um, Forrest as well, which is quite surprising. Um, we know that Atletico have a good eye for a player. They're quite good at um, replacing talent that they sell for big money um, more often than not. And, they, and to be fair to Atletico, they've done quite well to remain somewhat competitive and uh, over like the decade or so that Simeone has been at, at them and that's taken a lot of manoeuvring in the transfer market I don't think you maintain that kind of top three position that they have been without a lot of smart business in the transfer window and they've been losing players fairly consistently to bigger clubs and they've kept having to find talent so the fact that they've identified Brendan Johnson um, is very interesting and I, I wonder how he would have fitted in probably on the right wing in that 4-4-2 formation that um, Atletico like to play and um, I wonder how he would have been uh, under Dio Simeone. Now, obviously, playing a different role under Ange. But um, I think the fact that he they've made two substantial bids um, goes to show that uh, he is a player highly thought of around Europe, mm. potentially. And it's also been known that, obviously, with the points deduction, Nottingham Forest are going to have to sell one of their star assets before June or by the by the uh, by the June deadline. Is there anyone that you would take? I mean, we did speak off air talking about Morgan Gibbs White. Is there anyone else, maybe potentially? Yeah, Gibbs White is the obvious one. I, I think he's highly talented. I think he's really broken, um, starting to really come into his own in the last couple of years uh, for for Nottingham Forest. A really good number ten, also potentially a good number eight as well. I guess the other one might be Awioni, who's uh, got a good goal scoring record. Is a big physical striker. Could be if we do end up selling Richarlison, could be a decent alternative to him. Albeit he's had his, fit, his fitness issues, um, but he he's um, a, a physical striker. Albeit at the moment um, he's out the side for Chris Wood. Uh, other than that, I don't see too many uh, players I'd really want. Elanga, potentially. I like him. I think he's had a good season, but I don't know if he's good enough. Uh, he's much better than what we have already. So I think Forrest have a decent team, but I don't know, apart from maybe Gibbs White and... Um, and are we only, is anyone I'd be that interested in? I don't know. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm the same thinking of you. With Gibbs White, I'm not sure... If there's a, I mean, I, I think he's a top player, but I just, in terms of it, like the number eight, number 10 position, I'm not sure if he's better than what we got. Um, I think obviously he's not better than Madison, but he'd be very good. At, uh, I reckon he's probably more suited than Lacelso in terms of, I think he's better off the ball and obviously he can stay, uh, um, he's much, stay, he stays fit a lot more. And then the number eight, I think he could be a decent alternative to Saar as well. Um, I don't know if he's better than Saar, but um, I think he could be trained to be a bit more aggressive and um, play that role as well. So I think he's quite a versatile player, Gibbs. I really like him. I think he's done really, really well. And I think he's got another level to go up as well. Mm. Um, and finally, we're going to talk about this Manchester City game, which has been postponed as the Spurs official uh, did confirm with us yesterday. Tottenham's Premier League game against Man City has now been postponed due to Pep Guardiola's side progression into the FA Cup semi-final. It's been rumoured that this game is going to now take place on the week leading up to the last game of the season, uh, which is going to be an absolutely mammoth tie in terms of the Premier League title race. And I got a feeling 
if things just carry on going the same way as they are, there could be 60,000 Man City fans in that stadium. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. But, um, <laughs> it, look, it's, I think we much would prefer to play that game um, at that point than the point we were going to play them in because I think having City, Arsenal and, and um, Liverpool all in a row would be a lot to ask for to get results consistently. But uh, if there's a bit of a break and then I think, especially because I think Chelsea might be midweek in, in one of those in one of those game weeks as well, having the City game in between Burnley and Sheffield United potentially in the last week of the season, I think will be a lot more manageable than um, than where it was before. So I think it's a good thing. Um, and I think, hope, look, hopefully we're out of sight for top four by then, but something tells me we're not going to be. So I don't think there's going to be 60,000 City fans. I do think Tottenham will want to win the game and it's going to be important. Let's just hope City are out of sight by Arsenal from the, by then. Well, let me put put it to you this way then. What if Spurs need to win it to get top four, but you're also handing Arsenal the title in, in, the, in the same uh, kind of motion? What would you prefer? Uh, <laughs> I'd have to I'll allow City to win. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, more, more than likely there could be 60,000 Man City fans in there. I wouldn't say more than likely. I wouldn't say more than likely. I don't think Arsenal... I, look, I'm hoping Arsenal have a bit of a drop-off between now and then. Yeah, we're all hoping that and then we can just support our team in peace. But uh, look, that is your Tottenham update for today. Let me know in the comment section below your thoughts regarding all the news stories we brought to you today. Like, subscribe and comment. And as always, come, come on you Spurs. Spurs.